We are Teachers College, the first and biggest school of education in the nation. Here in a single square block in the heart of New York City, we have invented and reimagined the modern K-12 classroom and the community school. And we are also leaders in many areas of psychology. The fields of education psychology, special education, conflict resolution, and spirituality and psychology were all launched at Teachers College. Today, the many psychologists on our faculty are breaking new ground in autism and intellectual disabilities, organizational change, school psychology, human resilience, and supporting the mental health of the global refugee population. This week, as we celebrate the class of 2021, we are joining the conversations between the newest recipients of TC's Medal for Distinguished Service and three members of the TC faculty. Tonight's recipient is committed to challenging every traditional notion about how the human mind works, examining cognitive, brain, and behavioral systems as both reflect and influence human relations and society. The Richard Clark Cabot Professor of Social Ethics in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University, Mazarin Banaji, believes that once we truly understand ourselves as individuals and institutions, then we can work to improve ourselves and become the people we wish to be. She believes in the words of William James that sit at the entry of her office building. The community stagnates without the impulse of the individual. The impulse dies away without the sympathy of the community. Professor Banaji coined the term implicit bias in the 1990s, not realizing that it would so fully enter the public's consciousness a decade later. She co-developed the implicit association test she co-founded Project Implicit in 1998, where over 30 million tests of implicit bias have been recorded, revealing, as she says, the thumbprint of the culture on our brains. Her co-authored book, Blind Spot, Hidden Biases of Good People, is widely read in many languages, and especially in the United States during this period of moral reckoning. Her insightful multimedia series, Outsmarting Human Minds, brings this concept to life through engaging podcasts, videos, and demonstrations. They all have one common thread. By knowing science, we can take the steps to outsmart our minds and improve the decisions we make in life and at work. The host for tonight's discussion is TC's own Karen Block, Professor of Education and Psychology. Her work focuses on understanding how women and people of color successfully navigate careers in professional contexts where they are in the demographic minority, as well as the influence of gender and racial stereotypes on perceptions of leaders. She also works with leaders to enhance their understanding of the barriers created by stereotypes in their own organizations and what they can do to intervene. She has co-edited a special issue of the Journal of Applied Behavioral Science on creating social equity as an organization change issue. Professor Block is the founding co-director of the Institute for Psychological Science and Practice at TC. She teaches research methods to all of the doctoral students in psychology at Teachers College, and Professor Block is highly praised by TC students as a dynamic, engaging, and compassionate teacher who, as one student puts it, makes the material come alive. Good evening. Welcome everyone to the second of our virtual Convocation Week events honoring the 2021 recipients of the Teachers College Medal for Distinguished Service. To all our graduates and their families, congratulations on your well-deserved achievements and all the best throughout your continuing journeys. Awarding the Medal for Distinguished Service is always a highlight of Convocation Week. Our past honorees in psychology include Jerome Bruner, Bruno Bettelheim, Susan Fisk, Walter Michelle, Temple Grandin, 
The TC faculty members, Morton Deutsch and, jo and Edward Edmund Gordon, and TC alumnus, Carl Rogers. While their fields of achievement are diverse, they share one common link. They represent the best of the ideals of our college, fostering a culture of excellence and demonstrating true leadership to make a real difference in our communities, our country, and our world. Our honoree tonight is no exception. Please join me in welcoming Professors Mazarin Banaji and Karen Block to the virtual stage. Welcome well, to you both. Thank you. Hi, and congratulations, Mazarin. Thank you, Provost Raleigh. We're delighted to have you join the TC family tonight. Now I would like to turn the program over to you both. Thank you, Provost Raleigh. Dr. Banaji, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to the tremendously committed and accomplished graduates of 2021. Before we begin our conversation, I'd like just to say a few words about them. The graduates of 2021 demonstrated incredible perseverance to achieve this milestone in a year unlike any other year that we have known. Because of the pandemic, they took most of their classes online. They defended dissertations in a virtual Zoom world, and they created a learning community virtually. Distance did not stop, stop them. They showed grace and gratitude to us, the faculty, because we were learning as we went. And they also faced dislocation and sometimes personal loss. It was a year unlike any other because of the effects of centuries of systemic racism that were no longer in the shadows. The graduates of 2021 persisted despite the toll this year took on the minoritized students and their families in our community. In fact, the class of 2021 sees this moment. They examine systemic racism, its origins, its consequences in their scholarship. When we look at their dissertation titles, it is amazing. In their practice, they organized a decolonizing psychology conference that was absolutely incredible in terms of tips and things to think about as we practice being psychologists. The class of 2021 came to TC to do this work and they're now moving forward to share this work in the world. And there is no greater honor for the class of 2021 than to have you, Dr. Banaji, as their convocation speaker. You are the penultimate scholar practitioner. You've dedicated your career to disrupting and dismantling bias and its unseen effects. As a scientist and scholar, your work has driven policy and practice in so many arenas, the courtroom, the classroom, the boardroom, even in the physician's office. So when we were preparing for this, um, I was thinking of a quote uh, by George Miller, the past president of APA, who challenged our field to give psychology away to improve the lives of others. Dr. Banaji, you embody this challenge in all that you do. And we are beyond thrilled that you are here tonight to speak with the class of 2021 and their families as they move forward at this moment of change in the world. So Dr. Banaji, can you show the class of 2021 that you in fact have a medal? It arrived in the mail. Uh, thank you. It's got a gorgeous blue ribbon. I will move it into so you can see it. It is absolutely amazing. Any recognition is, of course, one that one is grateful for. But in this year, when this work that we have done has met with such backlash, I will tell you that this is going to be uh, a very special recognition. So thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. And when we were thinking about tonight, we thought, well, it would make sense to start at the beginning. So since we are Teachers College, mm -hmm. can you tell us about your role um, as a teacher and also the roles that teachers have played in your life? You know, first of all, I should say it is humbling for me to be speaking about teaching to a group of graduates um, who have spent the better part of their recent waking lives thinking about this topic and striving to improving teaching. But I may have one bragging right. Uh, my life as a teacher began at age five. <laughs> um, I was what um, they called a sick child. Um, I was born seriously premature 
in the mid 1950s in a relatively underdeveloped town in the middle of India. Uh, my mother traveled in a rickshaw, uh, pulled by a man, uh, to the hospital with her brother, my uncle, riding his bicycle alongside her. So even if I wasn't going to be born then, <laughs> that rickshaw ride would have made it impossible for me not to exit. Um, now, having several health issues that came with that made it very easy for people to say, oh, she shouldn't go to school. Um, she shouldn't go out and play with other children. Uh, these, my parents were very well-meaning, but they were incredibly protective. And so I was mostly housebound. Um, the pandemic, for example, had no adverse <laughs> impact on me. It just reminded me of my childhood. Um, so, you know, what do you do when you're in a house with no phone, no TV? Um, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you do? You read. Um, and so first you read all the children's books and then you read them all again. And then you pick up a fat book that maybe called something like Leaves of Grass. <laughs> and and you are, you're young and you have no idea that this was written by somebody many, you know, many, many, many thousands of miles away. But that was my incredibly privileged uh, upbringing. My mother came from a family of teachers. She, had, she and her three sisters, all four of them were teachers. Um, now, of course, by the time I'm a toddler and a little older, it's the early 1960s. And my mother has opened a kindergarten school in our apartment, which is not a big apartment. And because I'm home a lot to get me engaged, my mother asked me if I would just help her out by teaching a three-year-old some important material, how to draw lines and how to draw curves. And I took this pretty seriously, you know, and when you're a five-year-old, a three-year-old seems completely inept, uh, somebody who needs years to catch up uh, with you. So one of my earliest memories is this hallelujah moment when the kid produced a straight line and a curve, a perfect curve. Um, so when people ask me about my teaching style or my stamina at teaching mostly, I always say, but you see, uh, I had a head start. In terms of teachers who had impact on me, yes, there was mother, uh, but it wasn't until I got to graduate school that I found a teacher who let me know in no uncertain terms that I was not pushing hard enough. That was not easy for me, okay? In fact, it was painful. But that experience of allowing me to come face to face with my own limitations, then knowing that that limitation was not permanent, it just had to be set aside. And that was the greatest gift that this teacher gave to me. Thank you, wonderful. So thinking about um, your research and the work you did with the encouragement of that teacher when you did move beyond your boundaries, um, you coined the term implicit stereotype in a paper in 1990, and then the term implicit bias in another paper. And today these phrases have entered the vernacular, hundreds of mentions of implicit bias every day in every corner of our society in Google Alerts. So I think a question that we all have is, what was the path that led you to do this groundbreaking research? Um, uh, let, let me pick just one, one moment, which was the early moment, because you graduates are gonna be in that moment yourselves uh, very soon. I started uh, my career studying aspects of human memory. Um, I was very happy doing research on human memory, but then I made an unexpected discovery. The subjects of the studies that I was doing seemed to be denying female names the quality of fame that they were happily giving to male names. And they seemed completely unaware of it. So I quizzed them over and over again. Are you sure you weren't using the gender of the name to make your decision? And they would say, of course not. They would actually be offended that I would suggest such a thing. And this effect was rooted in their memory. And I was just completely puzzled by their lack of awareness of that bias. So I became really interested in this question of, you know, what is this internal criterion long before you are judged in a courtroom we're judging people inside this courtroom in our head. And this internal criterion or judgment that we are setting, 
that they were passing on others, they had no awareness of. And then all I had to do is extend this and say, what about the poor person in the world who's being judged? Is she aware that this just happened? And it just hit me in one moment that neither the person doing the harm nor the person being harmed were aware. But I was three years into my assistant professorship. I was on a path to studying human memory. I couldn't just switch from studying one thing and then move on to studying something called gender bias that had not even entered my consciousness as something that I should look at. But I was just compelled to do it. And I will give an example. I was an assistant professor uh, at, at Yale University. This was a time when Yale did not have a tenure track. It was expected that you would come, you would spend five years there. You were told that if you were, at, you know, if you were really good, maybe they would promote you for another five years and then you were expected to be gone, okay? Uh, and because you were not expected to be there permanently on the faculty, nobody invested in you. Okay. Um, and that kind of benign neglect was, I think, exactly what I needed to make that switch. I think if I had gone to a kinder, gentler place with a tenure track, I would never have made that switch. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a moral there uh, somewhere. Um, and then, of course, as you mentioned, uh, one thing led to another. Uh, fields were changed. Students came in to work on these new questions. I didn't have the language to talk about it. But I knew that in the field of human memory, there was a concept called implicit memory. I knew that there were amnesic patients who could not remember things in the usual way, but they still had something stored in their heads that told us, yes, they had that information there. And I thought the easiest thing to do is to take implicit memory and call this implicit stereotypes. And then a few years later, uh, Tony Greenwell and I coined the term implicit bias. Then of course the IAT was born. And the day I took my own first implicit association test was um, the single most transformative day of my life. Um, many people are smarter than me. They take the test, they accept the test result and they know it's saying something about themselves that they didn't know but I resisted for a full five minutes. <laughs> I just refused to believe that that test score telling me about my race bias was actually me. I said, the test is screwed up, something's wrong with this damn test. Uh, and then a few minutes later after trying different variations, I knew that it wasn't the test that was screwed up, it was my head that was screwed up. And that's the cultural thumbprint. And that is the thumbprint of the culture that is so invisible to us. I love the fact that our culture is using the word systemic every day and so many times. And thank you for using it because what we discover when we discover these effects on us is that it is in the system. It's in the air we breathe. It's in the water. You can't pull it out and just say, here it is. This is systemic racism. To be systemic means it has spread entirely through a system, right? Yeah. And you ended up in this field just because of serendipity and trusting a finding. That's yeah. so fascinating as a researcher, because many times our hypotheses aren't confirmed, but that might lead us to the most interesting moment in our career. Yes. Uh, in fact, um, you're, you're really quite right. And maybe I can say a little bit about that now, because, you know, um, Emily Dickinson, uh, the, the poet, uh, as you may know, was a recluse. You know, she never left her home in Amherst, Massachusetts. And then there's all this stuff that's pouring out of her. How is she to know whether all of this is just rubbish, the ravings of a mad woman, or the invention of the modern form of poetry? You know, so she wrote to a mentor of hers asking for advice. But being Emily, she didn't say, how am I doing? She said, the sailor cannot see the north, but knows the needle can. You know, every generation of us, every one of us, we develop our own little needles. And, and the needle, you know, can be so many things. It can be the young poet, Amanda Gorman, you know, telling us something like, we're witnessing a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished and you see something and what that means that you never saw before. Or you can be a scientist with a vaccine in his hand showing the way north. You know, we're just fortunate, I think, to be human because we have the capacity to tell the difference between the fact that we are unfinished and yet 
what awaits us as we evolve further and further. Beautiful. So thinking about um, taking the IAT and how you felt about the results, um, I bet you pretty much everybody on this call has taken the IAT. And I hope if not, <laughs> so that sorry. they will, as soon as we're done, as, as, uh, as we said in the introduction, 30 million people have taken this test. And that is really astounding. And it is really a different kind of measure than our standard Likert scale. Because if we were to take that, we would say, absolutely, the culture did not leave a thumbprint on me. So it really has been groundbreaking. And what I'd love to hear about is how, once you take the IAT and you see this is the cultural thumbprint, how does understanding this and knowing this help us become the people that we mean to be um, and thinking about where we are in the world if these are our implicit biases? Right. Um, I love Likert scales. <laughs> I use them all the time. They're marvelous. In fact, one of the first papers I wrote when we were trying to persuade people that implicit attitudes were real and they wouldn't believe uh, that, that they were, um, you know, I did all sorts of things to try to get them uh, to believe it, including doing a, a, a silly study that had a brain image in it, because when they saw it happening there, then they had to uh, believe. But the, so, the, so the question is, you know, when you come face to face with your own something about yourself that's not doesn't seem true, you know, on the one hand, I think we've been there before, you know, so many times human beings have made discoveries um, that have not sat well, you know, I always for me, my favorite moment in science uh, is the moment um, when Galileo turns a telescope and looks at the moons of Jupiter's and they are not moving they're moving, <laughs> they're not doing what they were supposed to be doing and being stationary. And, and you have a choice in that moment. What are you gonna do? You know, you know what happened to Copernicus. So if you're smart, you should say nothing. But I think there is something in us when we see something that other people aren't seeing, we say, even children will say, come look at this with me. And I think we are in this moment where we can put our faces up in front of that telescope, the equivalent of that. The methods are not gonna be perfect. You know, the, the pictures we will see will be just rudimentary images of what we will eventually learn about ourselves. But we are in a very exciting moment where for the first time, the mind sciences are in a position to be able to show us things about ourselves that if I think we were the good people that we think we are, we would pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. And the world has, you know, come knocking and the way that systemic racism has played out in a way this past year where it's on camera and there is no denying where we are in this country, where do you think we stand? Where do you think our society stands in terms of um, being able to take that telescope and yeah. do something about it? You know, the telescope allows you to see things that your own naked eye missed before. They were right there. Those things were right there. But apparently we were not seeing them. So what can I say? These, these last, you know, five years or so have been a terrible time in so many, many ways. Um, I was telling myself I'm lucky that I'm not personally affected by, uh, by it. But I was eventually finally <laughs> affected because, you know, about a year and a half ago, the ex-president of the United States did issue an executive order, executive order 13950, <laughs> I will not forget it, that said that one cannot teach about implicit bias to anybody. Um, first, not to anybody who was a part of a federal agency. I was scheduled to give talks to three federal agencies Two of them called and canceled. Um, one boldly went forward in spite of the executive order, which tells you that humans have choices in these moments. But then the executive order was extended to say you cannot teach about implicit bias to anybody who is a member of any organization that ever receives a federal grant uh, or federal support of any kind. And that included lots and lots of places. So there was, you know, so there, th that was um, that was a moment in which I, I think, confronted 
very directly a threat to my work. It was being shut down. Okay. Look, we are in a different place. Uh, I read this morning in the New York Times that we are in New York City, people are seeing tulips as being brighter than they have ever been before. And the question is, are the tulips different? You know, is there something going on with the type of winter we had? And the author says, yes, it may be all of that. But really, we are seeing, seeing tulips to be brighter because we have hope, finally. And, and I would say that I had exactly that experience. My partner of 40 years and I were walking down in Cambridge, and I said to him, did there used to be tulips here before? I had never noticed them. And look at how bright they are. Is the sun shining on them? So clearly, this is a perceptual thing. I think there is a moment right now of a little bit of hope. So if I may show you a piece of data yes, please. that I think will give um, the graduates a sense of both. We cannot, we're scientists, we cannot deny the bad when we see that it's bad. Uh, in fact, that's our job. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. gave a talk to the American Psychological Association meetings just a few weeks before he was assassinated. And when he, he said to um, psychologists, you know, when they said, what should we do? We want to be part of the movement. And I think he knew that we would be somewhat inept at being part of the movement in the way in which he was. But he said, you can do us the favor. You can do the movement a favor. And you can tell it like it is. And I think from Kenneth Clark uh, until today, we have large numbers of people in our field who have been telling it like it is. So I see this graph as partly just telling it like it is, but also telling you that yes, there is a reason that the tulips are brighter <laughs> this, this year in New York, we are seeing change. So um, I can't, I, I forget that I can't use my mouse, but Soleil will use her mouse to point us to the, the upper left hand graph, the one that says sexuality. So this is a test that measures your mental association of gay and straight with good and bad, okay? People can say that they don't have you know, bias, um, but our test might show otherwise. In fact, we've had the hard job of showing certain gay activists that they themselves may have harbored anti-gay bias in themselves that they were not aware of, right? The thumbprint of the culture on their brain. So in the year about 2005, anti-gay bias on our test was really high. So was explicit bias, okay? So there were, but then we noticed something. These are data that have been collected and analyzed and published by an amazingly bold graduate student by the name of Tessa Charlesworth. Um, nobody, you know, uh, Karen mentioned that, you know, 30 million tests have been taken. And, you know, to analyze even a big subset of those data um, is, is an incredible feat. I had suggested it to many graduate students before and nobody took me up on it, but Tessa did. And she has whacked the hell out of these data to produce these amazing results. What she shows is that whatever our bias was, our anti-gay bias, since about 2007, it has been steadily coming down, okay? We have a forecast. We have these fancy models. They will tell us where we are going and look at the change, okay? Is there bias still? Yes, we are above that zero line. The zero line is the line of neutrality. If I have no uh, bias one way or the other, if for me, gay and straight are equally good and bad, then that line, that blue line that's coming down should have been flat and sitting on the zero line, but it isn't. It was very high, but it is heading downward towards neutrality, okay? Remember Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous line that everybody now knows, um, and, and, and the one in which he said that the moral arc of the universe is long, meaning change is slow, but it bends towards justice. To me as a scientist, to you as, as people who are going to take what you have learned as teachers and, and go out there and try to change the world, you should know these data. You should know that, yes, there is bias and we have to keep talking about it, but there is no need for us to say, we can't change. We are changing. Something is happening here that is making us change. So I get very excited and very happy because most of my life I've shown that human beings are just jackasses, okay? But <laughs> every now and then data, in fact, my colleagues have been teasing me, Mazarin, how does it feel, you know, to have evidence that shows human beings are actually good <laughs> for once? Um, yes, this is coming up. Look over to the next graph. This is a graph that measures 
attitudes towards race, black and white, good and bad, or skin tone, dark skin, light skin, and so on. That bias is also falling down, okay? It is coming down, but you can look at it in whichever way you want, and the accurate way to say it is, it's not coming down nearly as fast as the others are. Why? Why? Given that the mind's capacity now has been demonstrated in the sexuality test, at the very least, we can drop our bias by 64%. We did something. Why can't the same happen for race? It is not happening. Okay. And, but it is not stable. It is still moving. Okay. There is, there is something that happened in January 2017. You can see a tiny little bump up there in the year 2017. It goes in the negative direction both for race and for skin tone, and notice for disability. For the disability bias, which is largely flat, it did get worse in January of 2017. I need not tell you what the event was that happened, but we can track these data you know, to the, to the, to the point at which the ex-president made comments about a journalist with disability. So think about the power of a single individual to move a culture of millions of people away from where they were heading on their path to change. But also see that the impact was not forever. It turned right back and it is now heading down for race, for disability that's going to take 200 years if we don't do something uh, now. All right, I'm gonna just stop with that and tell you, look, take these data for what they are. They're, they're showing us our bias, but they're also showing us that we are capable of change. Thank you. It's really wonderful to see data and to see data that shows maybe that the arc of justice is thinking about bending in the right direction, especially now. Yeah, um, I want your, your students to really think about this. What is it that's making sexuality change? I have lots of reasons. If you ever have ideas for why you think sexuality is changing so much faster than race, um, I have many theories that we're going to be testing. Please write to me and tell me what you think uh, is the difference and why one is going to be so much harder than the other. Okay, so can we ask for some of our graduates to engage that challenge and email Dr. Banaji? Yeah, or put it in the chat. We might or even put it in the time. chat because we will have time for um, other questions. Uh, so because this work has been so important, the implicit bias training is happening all over and it's happening from ballet companies to even police departments where um, we see that snap judgments and quick decisions happen and have um, really deadly consequences. So what is your take on the value of these trainings on implicit bias? You know, you will find that in the world you enter, there will sometimes be a lot of noise from the extremes. And there are two extreme views here about implicit bias training. And I really will want to explain to you where I sit because my views on this have been routinely misconstrued. Um, I do sit at the golden mean or actually the golden median, given that we are statisticians, we can say we're at the golden median on this issue. One view on implicit bias, so-called training, I just call it education. Uh, I'm, I, you know, I don't know that what we're doing is, is, is really is, is having the kind of impact that I think that we need to measure and demonstrate. One view says implicit bias education is completely useless, okay? It does nothing at all, okay? I don't agree with that. Um, the other says implicit bias training is the solution to all of our evils. We need not do anything other than implicit bias training. That is completely wrong. Okay. Both of these are long. First of all, learning is never useless, you know, um, especially not something that is going to produce such defensiveness. Okay. So I'm a huge advocate of teaching and learning about this topic, especially this topic. Um, I'm a teacher to tell me that teaching and learning is useless are fighting words, okay? But I understand why people say, and I say to many corporations, for example, when I say to them, don't waste your time with just this. What I'm trying to say to them is that I understand those of you who say, get rid of implicit bias training, it's useless. They are just, they have very high aspirations. They are not usually opposed to teaching about implicit bias but they truly recognize, as we all should, that it is not sufficient. But I believe very much that if we impose change from the top, 
you know, if we go to police departments and we tell them that these are the things that have to happen and we don't care about the change internally, we are missing out on something. I have had police officers just sitting in the audience with tears streaming down their eyes when I show them the data, okay? So we can, and to have somebody like that transformed and then working within the system is of course a very different thing. So implicit bias training is not going to lower your bias. Imagine if I give you a lecture on good health and eating good food and exercising. At the end of my lecture, would you have lost any weight? I mean, of course not. But teaching is for a different purpose, you know? And so I am very critical of people who use implicit bias training as a little band-aid. Uh, but I'm also critical of people who say, it is not worthwhile. I say, think about the problem of climate change. Would you ever say to me, you know, I recycled once in 1990 for two full days and the climate didn't change at all, <laughs> okay? Because why should a little drop in the bucket of implicit bias education for two hours change something that I believe is a problem on the scale of climate change? It is just climate inside our head rather than the climate outside our head. It is affected by millennia of evolutionary history of our species, you know, decades and decades of learning in an atmosphere that we call society. So of course it's going to take many prongs, but I hope that you see that teaching about this has a place and that it can move people, that it can show that the needle is pointing in a direction that they can't see. And I would love to share, this is my little gift to you. So if you want it, it's yours to have. Um, if we can put up a slide that will just show you um, the uh, website that I created. So while, while doing research and teaching, I have been frankly somewhat dismayed about the quality of what goes under the label diversity training. I feel that more scientists and practitioners should work together to be able to create materials that are a little more persuasive. If any of you have gone through anything like that, you know, sexual harassment training or, you know, bias training, you know that it could have been done better. And so my little gift to you is this. It's a URL that you can remember. Um, it's called outsmartinghumanminds.org. That's all you have to remember. And what we've done here is created little modules, five, 10 minute pieces that take up, you know, a little tiny aspect of how our minds work, how we may be costing ourselves, and acting in opposition to our own values. Use these, they're for you, they're free, okay? Um, and they, 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 you know, no matter where you go, uh, whether you go into education directly or into an affiliated field, you will find that people around you do not understand these concepts. And to go back to Karen's idea from George Miller that we should give psychology away, this is an example of really desperately wanting to give psychology away. We can open one little module and just have it play. You won't hear anything. Uh, it's a little module that we made on helping. What's the problem with helping? And I usually tell the story about how a journalist called me on the phone once to ask if she could interview me. And I was gonna do it because I do do this sort of thing. I believe in giving psychology away. But when I heard who she was writing for, I said to myself, no, this is not a magazine that does a good job writing about psychology. I'm not gonna do this interview. And I said so to her. And she was sort of sad, but she said, okay, I'll tell my editor and so on. I thought I was taking a principled position until she said this very simple little word, you know, she's a oh, sentence. She said, Professor Bonaggi, I should tell you, uh, I used to be a student at Yale when you were a professor there. And all of a sudden, this principal decision to not do this interview just faded away. There was this connection now between her and me. And even though, I mean, I should have said, you know, Annie, I'm so glad that you and I shared a zip code in Connecticut for four years, <laughs> bye-bye. That's what I ought to have said. But, but my brain did not allow that to happen. Out of my words, without my permission, you know, I said something like, come over, I'll you know, talk to you for a while. Now that incident has stuck with me because when you analyze it, you can see how modern day isms happen, whether it's racism or sexism or whatever you wanna call, call these. Um, you know, we don't discriminate in the way in which our ancestors did. We don't get on a horse and go to the neighboring village and steal all their stuff and bring it to our village. You and I discriminate 
by who we help. We do a very nice thing. We, we discriminate in a very civilized way so that we don't look bad. I can go to bed every night knowing that I didn't harm anybody. I don't remember harming anybody. But if I'm going to treat people differently by helping selectively, then we as psychologists need to speak about helping as being a problem. Not that you should help less, but that you should be extremely conscious about where your help is landing. That requires an entirely new way of thinking about what you do every day and for whom. So take these, now this is an interesting little nugget. It might be helpful. I think this idea is too new. It's time has not come to tell people that they're harming by helping is going to be a hard issue to persuade them about. They'll say all sorts of correct things. Well, what am I supposed to do? And so on. And you will be there to try to figure it out in whatever organization you work in. Thank you. It's so important for our graduates to think about because graduating from this institution gives you a place of power. So who will you decide to help and how will you um, share that power? Such a really important message. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm wondering if we should take some questions, if there are any from the live chat or from the other chat, otherwise we can keep going. Okay, we have a question for Dr. Banaji. These results, about bias are great to see. What can we do to apply increased recognition of our bias to our lives and our work with others? Do you have advice about how to act on that knowledge by Joe R? So Joe, I, I think that the best thing I could tell you is that even though it's our job to call out the BS that we see in the world, we also have to remember that we are a much improved people today than we used to be. From in my home country of India, not that long ago, you know, a couple hundred years ago, women were expected to kill themselves when their husbands died. It was the practice of sati. If a man died, his wife would be burned um, along with his body. Today, we find these kinds of things just horrific, right? Um, Think about the Middle Ages, um, trial by ordeal. You want to know if somebody's guilty or innocent, you throw them in the water. If they sink to the bottom, then clearly they were innocent. But if they float to the top, they're guilty. So pull them out and kill them, right? The same brain, those people's brains were no different than our brain. But their minds and our minds are unrecognizable to each other. So how did this happen? It happened because people like you and I sat down and we asked, how can I be better? Now, implicit bias is not a thing where you can just take one lever and move it. It is like climate change. You have to do everything. You know, it's not just recycling because that apparently does very little, but it's recycling plus this and plus that and plus that. And the same thing for implicit bias. We have to do it. I believe that one of the reasons our attitudes towards gay people have transformed is because individuals changed because their grandchild said they were gay. So individuals were changing. Institutions, teachers college, Harvard University said, it's true that you're not recognized you know, as, as, as a unit, but we're gonna treat you like you're a unit for health benefits for your partner. Think about that. That's an institution now stepping in and keeping up with the grandmas who are changing because their grandchildren are telling them something. And then slowly, you know, at a snail pace comes the Supreme Court and it makes something legal. The, so I think that sexuality bias has fallen off in our lifetime so fast because every level is changing at the same time. This is not happening or has not happened yet for race, okay? Because your child is not gonna come back one day, aged 18, and tell you, Senator Portman of Ohio, dad, I'm gay. And now the Senator must change his mind about what it means to be gay. And as many of us said to the Senator, what are you going to do about race, given that your child is not going to come back at age 18 from college and say to you, Dad, I'm black? That's not going to happen. Are you therefore telling me that black Ohioans have no possibility of changing your mind? Right. So these are the first. It's the discussions. Then hopefully it are these. It, there are the tests. You know, I don't have to now worry about do I have hypertension or not. I can just strap a little gizmo to my wrist and I can know roughly where I stand. Are blood pressure machines totally accurate? No. 
They're just an approximate gauge of what's going on. Are they perfectly reliable? No, but they're good enough that they give me enough of a sense that I can save my life. Okay. And I think we're in that moment where we must use these methods, the best ones we have, to be shifting our behavior in line with our values. Thank you. That was a great question, Joe R. Um, do we have any other questions? I think we do from Elise, who asked a great question last night too. If the poison is in the system, how do you cure the system? Yeah, um, that's what it means. To, so, so I'm writing a, a, a paper right now with one of your other honorees, Susan Fisk, somebody I admire greatly. Um, and she and I, the social psychologists, have teamed up with a sociologist to write a paper on how everything from mind to systems now needs to be put together. I think you're entering the world at a very good time when there is a unification of the social and behavioral sciences, where we realize that we're all looking at the system in different ways. I'm poking around into the minds of individuals to see what's there. Um, you know, sociologists are looking largely at the system. Look, there are ways in which there has been poison in our system uh, forever, okay? Slavery was such a thing. True, we took care of it, but hardly in a way in which we can be proud. So it still remains a poison in the system. But it is a little bit different, okay? You can argue it's not, okay? And I have lots of data to show that we're not always improving, that there are moments, there are places, if you look at the data on, on infant mortality, um, you know, it will shock you because it's not just that it looks like we're getting better, but race differences are actually becoming more magnified than they might have been even under slavery. So these are real, real things that we must pay attention. So I will never be glib about the fact that change is happening. And I think you're pointing out that the poison being in the system makes it so much harder. How do you remove, you know, the lead from the walls? How do you remove, you know, the gas in the air that is uh, changing um, uh, our breathing? It is much harder but it can be done because it has been done before. And so I will say to you that coming together with people who are quite different from you, you are the social scientist, you might have a degree in education and in psychology, but I think you might wanna team up with somebody like a computer scientist who might know a lot about bias that is in algorithms, okay? And I am quite impressed by this young generation of computer scientists who are at the forefront and I'm part of a small little group at the Santa Fe Institute. We call, the group is called Algorithmic Justice. And we're looking at bias as it has become embedded in these very systems. So my answer to you is, I will not deny that the poison is in, in the system, but I will say that it can be flushed out with the kind of minds that we've been given and the kind of effort that we are able to expend and with the kind of privileged education that we've been given. Thank you. Do we have time for another question? For our grads who have no schoolwork, what should be on their summer reading lists? What books are you reading right now? I am reading a book called Cast, <laughs> so, the Wilkerson book. Um, and I was just so stunned by her reporting of this, you know, this amazing story about um, Martin Luther King Jr. visited India because he was very interested in Gandhi's philosophy of um, nonviolent, non-cooperation. Um, and, and when he visited a place where, where there were Dalits, these are people of a caste who used to be called the untouchables and that Gandhi gave a new name to and called them uh, children of God. Um, and when, when King was in this group, this Indian man said to the Dalit people, the untouchables, this man, he's an untouchable in his country. And King reports feeling this, you know, flush of anger uh, and thinking, what do you, what do you mean? <laughs> and, and then immediately realizing that, yeah, that, 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 that there was something to that. And so I think that you know, that book to me, these are my two countries, the country of my birth and where I lived for 24 years and the country that I adopted, this one. Uh, both of these are messy, big democracies. They, they, you know, rarely ever get it perfectly right. 
but I don't know of systems that are much better. And both countries have seen threats to liberal democracy in these years that uh, we should be very vigilant about. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I think Cast is a wonderful read. And I think something that stuck with me from that book was if you can change it, it's class. If you can't change it, it's caste. So really making the point that mm -hmm. we are in a caste system here, um, mm -hmm. which is, um, and, and as you said, uh, a historian, not a psychologist. And that's why it really is important that we read and think broadly. But I would like to use the time we have left to ask you one last question, which is what would you say to this graduating class as we send them away to change this world in this world that needs so much change? What mm -hmm. words of wisdom um, and also just words of warmth do you have for the oh. class of 2021? You mean the hard question. Um, From here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, look, there is a story that was told by David Foster Wallace. In fact, he told the story at a graduation and it goes something like this. He said, you know, there is, um, there is an older fish in the sea swimming happily uh, who encounters two younger fish who are hanging out together. And the older fish says to the younger kids, uh, younger fish, kids, how's the water today? And after he passes them by, one of the younger fish looks at her friend and says, what the hell is water? Okay, now the point is this, your world is so familiar to you. It, it is so enmeshed, the poison in the system, but also the good things, the tulips being brighter. These are all so enmeshed into everything. It is so systemic, if you will, that we cannot see it, okay? We, any one of us cannot see it all. We can't detect it. But each of us can see a different part of it, right? Somebody else, somebody older or younger than you, somebody who is somewhere else relative to you on the gender spectrum knows about the water, okay? Somebody whose grandparent swam to these shores can see things in an image that you can't. Are you wrong for not seeing it? Of course not. But are you limited in that, you know, if you don't learn from this, you will remain in a place that you don't wish to be? Yeah, so something, Somebody, you know, somebody else has this needle that Emily Dickinson uh, talked about, right? So I'm just gonna say something that I know will be among the hardest things for you to give up. It's hard to give up your own sense of what reality is, okay? So use the eyes of the other to see the world and shape the views of the other to see the world from your own unique perspective by saying, how's the water today? You know, let them be completely perplexed by what you have just opened up for them, given that what Teachers College has given you is an ability to be able to say perplexing things to people that will open up you know, worlds for them that are right around them that they haven't been able to see. Let them say, water, what's that? Okay. Thank you. What a wonderful way to sum it up. So like swim in the water together, stay in conversation and listen. Dr. Banaji, thank you so much for sharing the medal. Can we see it one more time? Yeah, you can. I'll show yes. you both sides of it. It's beautiful. It is it just really lovely. Is. You know, uh, I put it on and I marched around in my house. So just so you know, I was pretty silly when I got it. Thank you again. Yeah. We're all having our own Zoom graduations and our Zoom ceremonies. Thank you so much. You're a very busy person and you took the time out to really engage with me and with the TC community and with the graduates of 2021. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. I'm going to turn it over to Provost Rowley for some closing remarks. Thank you again. Swim in the water together, such great advice, I love it. Thank you both for taking the time to join us tonight. Wonderful conversation. Mazarine, again, welcome to the TC family and congratulations on receiving the medal for distinguished service. I'll keep picturing you marching around with your medal on. In One more round of congratulations to the TC 2021 graduates and their families. 
Tune in for the final installment of our TC Medalist series tomorrow night, featuring medalist Carol Dweck and TC professor Nathan Holbert. Thank you so much and have a great night. Thank you.